Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Royal Society. Welcome back to the Royal Society. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Bruce Hunt. Um, just before I do, a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, this talk is being recorded and will be podcast on the back of the recording, so um, please behave accordingly. <laughs> whatever you take that to mean. I certainly take it to mean uh, turn your mobile phone off, at a minimum. Um, it's also being videoed, but that's only to help with the making of the podcast later. Um, this is the last in our series of talks this term, um, and we, we, we have these talks partly for the sheer pleasure of having you all in this room, and partly to um, show the, uh, some of the highlights from our spectacular archives. And we've put some of them out on display here, and please come and look at them after the talk, um, and again, sort of treat them appropriately. Um, one of the things we have here, which uh, Bruce was just showing me, was the, the, ele the election certificate for Maxwell, and oh, to... <laughs> Sorry, let me start again. Good, good afternoon, is it? <laughs> for Kelvin. Um, and it's very interesting to see who actually signs his certificate um, from sort of from Faraday through to Wheatstone um, and others in between. So you, you get a sense of his allies and supporters. Bruce is Associate Professor at the University of Austin in Texas. He um, asked me to mention just sort of casually that uh, he's written a book called The Maxwellians, which has just been reprinted and is available in all good bookshops, um, and is currently working on uh, cable telegraphy and related matters, and therefore is very much focused at the moment on Kelvin. And he gave this talk yesterday, I believe, a version, um, yeah. a version of it to a Scottish audience. So today we get the English version, and we very much look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here's a familiar image of uh, Lord Kelvin, a picture taken in 1902 when he was nearly 80. And I think this is the usual sort of image people have of him as a distinguished elderly, elder statesman of science. I think it's worth remembering that he was only Lord Kelvin for 15 years of a very long life uh, and that most of his important work uh, was done uh, long before that when he, as we'll see, he looked rather different. Now, he was... Uh, awarded a peerage in January of 1892. Um, and uh, after 25 years as uh, Sir William Thompson, he had to choose a new name, uh, Lord Thompson being already taken. Um, friends and relatives made various suggestions. Uh, his niece, Agnes Gardner King, whose little book about her uncle is, I saw up on the shelves in this room, um, uh, said that among the suggestions were Lord Netherhall after his large country house at, uh, at Largs. And another suggestion, and one uh, that I particularly like, was Lord Cable. They very quickly, within a couple of days, settled on Lord Kelvin instead after a small river that flows next to the University of Glasgow, uh, in uh, the grounds of the University of Glasgow, where he'd been professor of natural philosophy for nearly 50 years by then, and where he had studied, where he had enrolled when he was 10 years old, become professor of natural philosophy when he was 22, so he had a very long association with it, and Kelvin was an, an appropriate name. I don't want to make a pitch that it, it, uh, it wasn't. Um, but it might seem odd to think that if Thompson had made a, a little different choice in 1892, we would talk now about degrees cable um, and, uh, and, and that the uh, American refrigerator brand would be the cableator or something, I don't know. Um, Certainly, Kelvin was a good choice, um, but I think Lord Cable would in some ways been an, an even better choice, um, in that it would have been better for me, I gotta say, as, as far as pitching the connection between uh, uh, Kelvin and, and telegraphy, but it would have also reflected uh, the main source of uh, Thompson's wealth and fame. That's how he made his money, which was quite a substantial fortune that he did make uh, eventually, was through uh, patent royalties on uh, cable equipment and work as a consulting engineer. 
Uh, and also, it was the source of his, of his, as I said, his fortune, uh, of his fame, uh, and it would have reflected the very close connection in his life and work between science and technology, between theory and practice. Um, submarine telegraphy was, and I don't know how well you can see this uh, in the back rows, but uh, um, uh, it was one of the characteristic technologies of the British Empire in the second half of the 19th century and well into the 20th. Uh, and William Thompson, Lord Cable, uh, was right in the middle of it almost from the beginning. Uh, the most famous cables were those across the North Atlantic, uh, famous transatlantic cables. Uh, but in fact, the cable network spread around the world in this map that dates from 1900, with the British Empire shown at least dimly in red, uh, reflects very much the, the course of these cables and their role in the British Empire. Um, that they played a, a very important part in the last third of, of the 19th century in linking together the formal British Empire, uh, the actual parts marked in red, and also the informal empire of trade and, and commerce that was so important, and finance that was so important to uh, the British Empire in that period. Um, now, almost all of these cables, from the very first cables that were laid in the early 1850s through 1900 and through well into the 20th century, almost all of the cables, at various times over 90 percent, uh, were built laid and operated by British firms. And after the 1860s, until uh, at least the turn of the century for two or three decades, um, uh, and in some cases quite a bit more, all of the long distance cables were operated with instruments designed and patented and many times manufactured uh, by William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, and firms that he controlled. Um, so he had an absolutely central role in this extremely important uh, technology of that period. Um, the f sort of zooming in here on a much smaller part of the world, this is a map of uh, the British Isles and surrounding waters from 1858, showing uh, the first um, uh, telegraph cables, submarine cables that were laid, beginning with the obvious one across the English Channel uh, laid in 1851 which was built, owned, and operated by a British company. Um, consisted of copper wires insulated with gutta percha, uh, a now forgotten substance derived from a tree sap from Malayan trees, rather like rubber, but not, not rubbery, not, uh, not elastic in the same way, a natural plastic, in fact. Um, it's a curious fact that this high-tech industry of the 19th century was reliant pretty much completely on Malayans with hatchets. Uh, uh, gathering gutta percha uh, from trees in Singapore and southern, southern Malaya. Um, the, uh, they would take uh, copper wire, uh, cover it with uh, gutta percha, uh, cover it with tarred hemp, and then wrap that around with uh, iron wires for protection uh, and lay it out, out the back of a ship. It proved very profitable. The first channel cable proved very profitable, mostly carrying uh, market information uh, between London and Paris mostly business, uh, business news traffic. Uh, and it was quickly followed by cables to Belgium, to Holland, uh, and to Ireland, both from Scotland and from, from uh, Hollyhead to uh, Ireland. And also some cables uh, were laid in the 1850s in the Mediterranean, the mid early uh, and mid 1850s. In this early period, a lot of these cables failed. Uh, the, the, People were just running the cables out the back of, of a ship, and uh, uh, enthusiasm often outrun, outran expertise, and people learned by making very expensive mistakes. Now, an important phenomenon turned up, a scientifically interesting phenomenon turned up on some of these early cables. Not on the very first short ones, but as they started to make somewhat longer ones. I encountered a phenomenon called um, retardation. That uh, a sharply defined signal, you know, dots and dashes that were sent in at one end, would emerge at the other, blurred together. Uh, you would try to send a, a, a rapid sequence of, of uh, dots and dashes or, or galvanometer deflections, as they would also be read, and they would, they would merge together and become indecipherable at the far end. 
that the signals seem to be slowed down and stretched out in the process of transmission. Um, this, and this seemed to get worse the longer the cable, which was a serious problem for people who were starting to plan really long cables. Some of the enthusiasts of the 1850s were already talking about cables across the Atlantic. Well, if retardation uh, started to be a problem on cables uh, a couple of hundred miles long, then, and it got worse on longer cables, then it might be a very serious problem on a 2,000 mile long cable, and it might make it impossible to signal <coughs> rapidly enough to turn a profit, to uh, be able to send it, carry enough traffic uh, to pay for itself. Uh, late in 1853, cable engineers in London uh, demonstrated the phenomenon to uh, Michael Faraday and asked his advice about it. Uh, in January of 1854, Faraday gave a lecture at the Royal Institution uh, here in London, in which he said that retard retardation provided striking confirmation of ideas that he had been propounding for some years on the relationship between induction and conduction yeah. of electrical currents. Views that before that had attracted relatively little support uh, in the scientific community. Uh, induction, Faraday said, has, must precede conduction. It's only after the insulating dielectric, the gutta percha, has been uh, uh, put into a state of inductive strain that a current can really flow through the copper in the middle. Uh, in ordinary overhead wires, this whole process happened so quickly that no one noticed it. And the, the signal seemed to go instantaneously and without any real distortion. But in a submarine cable, which was basically a really long capacitor, condenser, Leiden jar, uh, the, the amount of charge it could hold was very substantial and it could, the retardation was a, a very serious problem. Um, Thompson, who was then a 30-year-old professor at Glasgow, took up the problem later in 1854. And one of the papers over here uh, is the paper that he sent in to the Proceedings of the Royal Society, which is basically letters that he wrote to George Gabriel Stokes, a very nice portrait of downstairs, um, his good friend and fellow mathematical physicist. Um, there's an interesting story behind how they got into this, but I'll cut to the chase on this. And Thompson took up the theoretical mathematical question of what, what's going on with retardation and what can you do about it. And he was a great, uh, Thompson was a great student and proponent of Fourier's theories on heat conduction. And he found that he could apply the equations of Fourier, that Joseph Fourier in France had developed for the conduction of heat, say, along a, a metal rod. He could apply those to the, to the propagation, to the, the diffusion of, of uh, current or voltage along a telegraph wire, that they were the same equations. It's a very different physical problem in many ways, but the same equations. Uh, and he worked out. In, in the series of letters to Stokes uh, in late 1854, equations and curves reflecting the, the, the way the current would rise at the far end. That's what this reflects. You basically put down the, press down the telegraph key at the one end, there's a little gap, there's a little delay before you have any response at the far end, and then it gradually rises up. If you just hold the key down, that's the top curve. Um, you hold, just hold the key down. If you hold the key down for a little while and then, and then release it, you get these other curves. The current at the far end will, will rise and then, and then subside. Um, so, you know, how can you speed this up? Thompson, Thompson applies the equations. He figures out what's the optimal ratio between the gutta percha and the copper, the conductivity and the capacitance uh, for, uh, for the best signaling rate that you can get for a certain amount of investment in copper and gutta percha. Uh, and then a little later, he starts figuring out, and that's reflected in one of the other papers up here uh, from a couple of years later, he figures out ways that you can speed this process up by sending a current first in one direction and then in the other direction. Send a positive current and then a negative current, which will wipe out part of this um, and allow you to send, pick up a, a readable signal at the far end with less blurring and less retardation. Um, this led Thompson to take up uh, patenting uh, ideas for improved uh, telegraphy. And in fact, his very first patent filed in 1854 with his brother, uh, James, uh, an engineer himself, and uh, uh, McCorn Rankin, uh, another Glasgow engineer, 
um, was for improvements in cable design. That one didn't turn out to make a lot of money for him, but later Thompson's patents did make a lot of money. Now, by the 18, mid 1850s, as I've already alluded to, promoters were already talking about trying to lay a cable across the Atlantic. In particular, an American businessman named Cyrus Field was putting together a company with the idea that you could lay a cable from Valencia at the southwestern tip of Ireland to Newfoundland, the closest place in North America, and then connect uh, on into uh, New York, where Field was from. Uh, this was an enormously ambitious project, far beyond anything that anyone had tried before. Um, and it was not surprisingly hard to raise money uh, <laughs> to, uh, to pursue this project. Uh, Field struck out completely raising money in the United States. So in 1856, having secured some legal landing rights in Newfoundland, which was a very important asset for him, uh, he came to uh, London uh, and elsewhere in England and was able to raise very substantial amounts of money uh, quite quickly, particularly in uh, Liverpool and Glasgow as well as London, from people who were interested in having more rapid communications across the Atlantic for commercial purposes uh, to you know, markets in, in uh, uh, grain and cotton and uh, other commodities. Um, Field uh, launched this company late in, uh, in the fall of uh, 1856 and was promising to lay the cable the following summer. Summer was about the only time you could, uh, the Atlantic, North Atlantic was calm enough to uh, uh, contemplate uh, laying such cables. Uh, and he's, he, was, he was making very big promises. Um, now, if retardation is a problem, then it might be a really big problem on a 2,000 mile long cable, and this raised uh, doubts in the minds of some investors. This is where a man uh, could go on at more length about E.O. Wildman Whitehouse uh, comes into the story. He was a Brighton surgeon turned electrical experimenter who claimed to have uh, done experiments that showed that retardation was not really such a problem, that he had found ways to signal uh, you know, effectively through 2,000 miles of cable without without uh, serious retardation problems. Um, this was the sort of thing uh, Field liked to hear, particularly when White House got in a conflict with William Thompson. Uh, in Thompson's equations, those curves that I was showing, the retardation is proportional to the square of the length of the cable. It's proportional to the, the product of the resistance of the cable times its capacitance. And both of those are proportional to length, so the product of it is proportional to the square of the length. And he's quite explicit in these very papers that if you double the length, you quadruple the retardation. Um, so that could be a very serious problem. And even you know, unless White House or someone can, can allay those fears, uh, it might be impossible, even with Thompson's improved signaling techniques, to signal effectively through such a long cable. Um, they had Thompson and White House had a fairly lively exchange in the Athenaeum. Uh, they sort of patched things up and agreed that Thompson's theory was right, White House's experiments were right. It's just that uh, the interpretation of the experiments and the application of the theory needed to be reconciled. Uh, this was all, their patching things up was, I think, aided by the fact that White House was brought in as the chief electrician, the head of all electrical arrangements for the Atlantic Telegraph Company, for Fields Company. And Thompson was elected a, to the board of directors of the company by the investors from Glasgow. So they were, they were kind of thrown together in that way and managed to patch things together. Uh, through 1857, uh, uh, White House devised and patented various instruments, mainly um, some large relays and induction coils that he proposed to use on the planned cable. Uh, the, the Atlantic Telegraph Company gave White House a lot of stock, a lot of shares in the company, and also 13,000 pounds, 1857 money, that's a lot of money, uh, for his instruments and uh, uh, patent rights to those. Thompson was also working on these problems, but wasn't being paid really anything. Thompson, uh, White House's health prevented him from sailing on the first Atlantic expeditions in eight, the summer of 1857, and Thompson went in his place, basically volunteered to go in his place. Uh, the 1857 attempts didn't work at all. Uh, it turns out the, the apparatus for paying the cable out of the ships was not sturdy enough and not well enough designed, and they gave up on that and said, we'll do it next summer. Um, over the, and they just stored the cable on docks at Plymouth over the, over the winter, which was not a very good idea. Um, Thompson went ahead to devise his own alternative, well, this is, this is the cable, uh, about three quarters of an inch in diameter. 
2,000 miles long, not too much bigger around than your thumb, um, with the uh, uh, copper wire in the middle, the gutta percha, and then the iron wires around the outside. Uh, Thompson, in 1858, devised a much more sensitive detector of electric currents, his mirror galvanometer. Uh, a, a, it's a galvanometer, then use, instead of using a, a heavy pointer, a needle, um, he used a beam of light. You would use, have a, a lamp here, a beam of light would go in here, would hit a little uh, piece of mirror, uh, mirrored, mirrored glass, that was attached to a small uh, magnetic needle. And, that would, and then it's got a coil of wire around there that the current is fed into. An extremely sensitive detector of currents. And you could follow the spot of light as the uh, 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 needle, as the, rather the, the mirror was, uh, was turned. Um, and he did uh, uh, other important work um, in early 1858 in preparation for the renewed attempts that were made in the summer. The first several attempts in 1858 also failed. The cable kept snapping. But finally, in August, early August of 1858, um, the ships, which had met in the middle of the ocean, simultaneously pretty much reached Valencia and, uh, and uh, Newfoundland, uh, and the first cable was completed. The ensuing celebrations, particularly in America, were very uh, uh, excited um, that this was, this was depicted as the great triumph of Cyrus Field. <laughs> And the fact that it was actually, I have to say, I'm American and here in London, it was basically a British project uh, top to bottom. Uh, field was sort of the impetus for getting it started, but all the money, all the expertise, all of the manufacturing was, was uh, done in England. Uh, the celebrations in New York got out of hand. They had fireworks and set fire to City Hall and almost burned it down. Um, what was particularly embarrassing about that was that by then the cable was already failing. Uh, the cable was laid, but it never quite worked right. White House could never get his instruments to work through it very well. Uh, as he got desperate, as it seemed not to be working, he started using higher and higher voltages uh, from his induction coils, and this fried the insulation that what was left of it. Uh, the directors uh, uh, of the company got fed up with the White House and replaced him, removed him from the Valencia station, and put none other than William Thompson in charge. Um, and uh, Thompson spent several weeks there trying to get the cable to work while it became more and more obvious that a substantial fault in the insulation had appeared uh, some 300 miles uh, west of Ireland that they really could do nothing about. By late September, the cable had failed completely. They had sent a number of messages through. It had worked for a while, but it never worked very well. And given the the, the enormous excitement about its initial success, the disappointment was that much greater, and cable telegraphy, oceanic cable telegraphy, got the reputation uh, in the wake of this failure of being a failed technology, a great idea for a technology, but it just doesn't work. Um, and that uh, many people lost hope that you would be able to lay a cable across the ocean. In fact, plans were made, serious plans were undertaken by the big American company, Western Union, to uh, uh, run overland telegraph lines across the United States to the Pacific, up through Canada, up through Alaska, across the Bering Strait, across Siberia, and connect from London to New York that way. And they got pretty far with that before, as we'll see, they found out you could lay a cable across the Atlantic, and they gave that up. Um, Thompson returned to Glasgow uh, and continued to work on telegraphic problems. He didn't give up on this technology at all. And this is a letter, I mean, this is a, a picture of him that I think gives a better impression of, much better impression of what he looked like at the time he was doing his important work than the, the usual uh, Lord Kelvin ones. Um, this is him in uh, 1859. And in the same little book by Agnes Gardner King, his niece, that she gives this picture, um, uh, he later added a little inscription, and I'll show you that. He's reading a letter from Fleming Jenkin, a cable engineer, who he had gotten to know at that time reading a letter or letters from Fleming Jenkin about experiments on submarine cables, probably about March 1859. He added that note after he's Lord Kelvin, K, in uh, uh, 1892. And I've just been up in Glasgow reading piles and piles of letters from uh, Fleming Jenkin uh, to William Thompson, and I, I haven't quite been able to pin down exactly which letter uh, he's holding in the photograph, but pretty close. It's probably actually April. Uh, uh, of uh, 1859. Um, Thompson worked hard 
on uh, telegraph problems and on what could be done to correct the disastrous failures of the first Atlantic cable. Um, at the same time, Jenkin, Fleming Jenkin, was uh, working for uh, the R.S. Newell Company uh, at uh, Birkenhead near Liverpool, who were uh, undertaking one of the last big cable projects of that time, which was a British government uh, backed project to lay a cable down the Red Sea. There were already cable connections as far as Alexandria, down the Red Sea and across to India. In the wake of the Indian mutiny, the British government had an enormous interest in more rapid communications with India for security purposes, basically. Uh, and they, they let a contract for this uh, so-called Red Sea Cable, which would not be in one length. It would have a lot of intermediate stations because they didn't have, they'd lost confidence in really long cables. This turned out to be a total disaster, partly because the contract was drawn up in such a way that the government was on the hook whether it worked or not. Well, <laughs> the contractors didn't maybe do the most careful job, and uh, they made a lot of money, but it never worked. It, took a long, it wasn't as dramatic a failure, and it didn't fail all at once, but it just it never worked, and, and the various parts uh, failed one by one, and it was eventually abandoned. Uh, the failure of the Atlantic Cable, and then on top of that, the failure of the Red Sea Cable, uh, led to the uh, formation of a government uh, committee, uh, the Board of Trade and the Atlantic Telegraph Company formed a joint committee to investigate submarine telegraphy, and they issued a big blue book that laid out what the problems were and how they could be corrected. <coughs> this is a very important document um, in that it gave, it was a determined effort to restore the credibility of submarine telegraphy and to lay out scientific principles and careful engineering principles on how it could be made a success. Uh, and both Jenkin and especially Thompson testified extensively before the committee and their testimony played an important part in the committee's conclusion that there were ways to uh, make submarine telegraphy work. Well, a few years later, Cyrus Field, Cyrus Field never really gave up either. Uh, and after a lull in the early 1860s, partly because of the American Civil War, uh, he was able to regroup, raise money, and relaunch the Atlantic uh, Telegraph Company to try again to lay a cable. In the meantime, they, uh, they were able to charter the Great Eastern the one ship in the world that was big enough to carry the entire length of cable at once, uh, and uh, uh, manufactured a much larger cable, uh, thicker copper, thicker gutter percha, much more carefully made, much tighter quality control. That was one of the most important things, was to be able to measure and know the, spe the specifications, the conductivity of the copper, to know that there were no flaws in the insulation, to just have careful measurement and quality control throughout the process. And that was something Thompson had pushed hard for. They, uh, uh, the, they tried to lay the cable in 1865, and things seemed to be going fairly smoothly. And about two-thirds of the way across, the cable broke uh, because of a mishap with the paying out apparatus. It snapped and fell to the bottom of the sea. Uh, they tried to grapple it up, but really couldn't, and very discouraged, uh, sailed back to, uh, to Ireland. And a lot of people associated with the company just gave up. Uh, they just said, this is, this is jinxed. Um, Cyrus Field and William Thompson and a number of others, and particularly a man named John Pender, uh, who we could go on at great length about, but he was uh, later the, the main uh, entrepreneur who, who ran the, the world cable system um, that I showed earlier, uh, put up the money, managed to scrape up the money to try yet again. And they built another cable uh, and got it back on the Great Eastern, went, and it, everything went perfectly smoothly this time. It went straight across landed the cable, worked, worked fine. Even more impressively, and that's what's really reflected here, they went back and grappled up the 1865 cable, brought it to the surface, spliced on an, uh, an additional length that they brought along, and completed that to Newfoundland as well. And this is depicting the moment on the Great Eastern when they're testing the recovered cable to see that it has not uh, you know, gone bad in the, in the intervening year. And you'll notice here that they're using uh, mirror galvanometers. Um, uh, I've tried to figure out who the people in the picture are. It seems like they are, they're meant to depict individual people, but I haven't been able to nail that down. I'm not sure that the artist was that accurate about it. Um, this is another uh, cable testing room at Valencia on, on dry land, also a contemporary picture from 1866. And you can see it's a fairly simple setup, but they've got a lot of batteries on the floor. 
uh, a couple of guys there, and we'll get a sort of close up here. And you can see again, they're using Thompson's design of mirror galvanometer with this characteristic little curved piece at the top and the lamps and the, and the screens. Um, after the success of the 1866 cable, Thompson was awarded a knighthood. He became Sir William Thompson explicitly for his contributions to submarine telegraphy. Uh, and submarine telegraphy at, at that point, uh, after a gap of just a couple of years, really went into a boom period from the late 1860s through the 1870s. And that's when a great number of those cables that I showed on the earlier map were laid to India, to Australia, uh, to the Far East, uh, uh, eventually to, to South America, and further down, down the coast of Africa, all over the place. Um, the global cable network became a bulwark of British commercial and imperial power in the last third of the 19th century. It also had a big and continuing influence on British work in electrical science, and that's really what I've been studying, both in stimulating work in precision measurement and in directing attention toward propagation and field phenomena, uh, the propagation of electromagnetic effects in space and time, rather than just treating them as instantaneous forces across space. Uh, one thing I sort of skipped over here is that Thompson was very heavily involved in was standard units and setting up a British Association Committee on Electrical Units and Standards in the 1860s, early 1860s, which later Maxwell, Fleming, Jenkin, and a number of others were involved with, and they developed a system essentially of ohms, amps, and volts that we still use today uh, and, and did careful measurements to establish uh, uh, standard values for those. Um, now, the mirror galvanometer that they're using here was very sensitive and worked, worked well. But it didn't leave a record, and using it was very stressful for the operators because they had to watch this little point of light going back and forth and call out left, right, 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 left, right. You can imagine uh, what it was like doing that job. There was a great uh, call for a recording um, uh, receiver, and uh, Thompson turned his attention to that and in 1867 patented, and in 1870 he brought, it took a while to perfect it after that brought into service the siphon recorder, sometimes described as the world's first inkjet printer, uh, which uh, had, a, you can see it over here, it had a, a roll of uh, paper tape and a, that would be fed out and a very small siphon, a tiny hair-like glass tube that would have ink that was electrified by this device on the top here, a mouse mill it was called, that would, that would shoot the ink out on there. And this is the, the the siphon was set uh, on a moving coil between powerful electromagnets here. So it would respond to very slight currents and would make a wavy line on this paper tape, something like this. This is the siphon recorder alphabet. And this is what it would make, this, uh, this little line, a little paper tape. Um, and a, an experienced uh, cable operator could read that, you know, just like reading print or handwriting. Uh, and uh, you go to Porth Kerno in Cornwall where they have the Museum of Submarine Telegraphy. They have a couple of old timers who will still do that for you. And they'll just pull it out and oh, blah, 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 they just read it right off. Um, and you can see these are somewhat uh, curvy lines. That's because of the retardation, uh, smoothing out the uh, um, otherwise uh, sharp initial signals. Um, this, uh, uh, Thompson patented this and made a lot of money off it. He entered a patent pool, basically a patent partnership with Fleming Jenkin and another cable engineer, Cromwell Fleetwood Varley. And after the cable business took off in the late 60s and early 1870s, they began pulling down, each of them, thousands of pounds a year uh, from their cable patents, particularly the siphon recorder and some associated ones. And that was real money in those days. I mean, a good academic salary would be a few hundred pounds. They're making uh, thousands of pounds just from the patent royalties and also making substantial amounts as consulting engineers on cable projects. And also, Thompson went into partnership with James White, an instrument maker uh, in Glasgow, uh, to uh, manufacture and sell uh, these kinds of instruments. So he's making uh, uh, money from that as well. Um, Thompson's siphon recorder became a standard instrument on cables after the early 1870s pretty much all of the long cables that you saw on that map, and I'll get the map up in a, again in a minute, um, were 
operated by a siphon recorder, and that technology didn't change much. Um, with some minor refinements, siphon recorders continue to be used well after the turn of the century. Um, and, uh, uh, and as I said, brought in a substantial income. Here's an idea of the substantial income. In 1870, Thompson bought a, a yacht, the Lala Rook, which he would became, partly because of his experience going on the cable expeditions, he was uh, an avid sailor. He loved to be at sea. Um, and uh, after the death of his first wife, who had been in ill health for quite some time, um, he uh, took the Lala Rook. He had been, um, he had stopped in Madeira in 1873 during a cable laying expedition and met a young, young woman there, Frances Blandy. Uh, and uh, they fell in love and he sailed the Lala Rook back the next year and, and they got married and she became Lady Thompson. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then he used his accumulating cable profits to build a large house at Largs, south of Glasgow on the sea, um, called Netherhall. Uh, in 1875. So cable telegraphy had been very good to William Thompson. He, uh, he did, uh, did very well from it. Now, by, this is back to our world cable map, by that time, and really very quickly after the first successful uh, Atlantic cables uh, in the 1860s, the cable business became quite conservative technologically. Once they had something that worked, they didn't want to mess with it. And you think about it for a while, you can understand why this was. That the risk of trying something new that might fail was so enormous that it was much more attractive to them to just keep repeating what they knew worked. Uh, and so the, the design of cables themselves hardly changed from the late 1860s until the 1920s. There were copper wires with gutta percha and iron wire around them. That's about it. Um, there were some refinements in the design of sending and receiving apparatus. But most of them were variants of Thompson's siphon recorder. Uh, that was the standard piece of equipment. So that the, the, the industry was very profitable and extremely important commercially and strategically. It was not, after, after an initial period, in the 1850s and 60s, I think it was a, a great boost to technological innovation. Uh, after that, not so much. It did, however, stimulate a lot of important scientific work, which then got a momentum of its own, of taking up problems and issues that had come up in cable telegraphy and pursuing those from their, their intrinsic scientific interest as well as their possible applications. Um, uh, well, this, I could have put up a very similar map from uh, uh, 30 or 40 years later. The cable network continued to grow after the turn of the century. It had some more. Uh, cables laid direct across a few places. By then, of course, radio telegraphy had begun to compete um, uh, with the submarine uh, cable network, though in this country, the, the big cable company, Eastern uh, and uh, its associated companies, was uh, forced to merge by the government with uh, the big uh, wireless Marconi firm to make what became cable and wireless uh, as a way to avoid uh, destructive competition. Uh, between the two, uh, two modes of communication, which might have destroyed the, the uh, strategically important uh, cable network, which had a sort of security to its communications that radio telegraphy didn't. Back to Lord Cable. Um, Thompson himself remained remarkably energetic, um, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, through this period, through the 1870s and 80s and on. Uh, he also became rather conservative in various ways. Um, uh, uh, he became, was widely seen, I think, by the 1880s as uh, a little out of step with, uh, uh, with the newest scientific ideas that in, I think, he stopped keeping up with the literature. That's pretty clear. He stopped reading anything. Um, uh, he, he kept up with a lot of scientific developments from what his friends told him and what he heard at conferences. But he was notorious for not, not reading uh, the, the literature. Uh, he stuck to the elastic solid theory of the ether after almost everyone else had given it up. Uh, he never, as is well known, uh, really picked up on Maxwell's electromagnetic field theory. There's a brief period around 1889, 1890 when he does, but then in the words of Oliver Heaviside, uh, who was a great proponent of Maxwell's theory, 
the elastic solid theory had crystallized his brain, he said, and, uh, and that though he, through great effort, had put himself into a different state for a while after Hertz's discovery of electromagnetic waves, it snapped back into its previous arrangement soon enough. He was also well known as an opponent of Darwin's theory of evolution on the grounds that the Earth was not old enough through arguments that he had of the cooling rate of the Earth. The Earth was not, could not be old enough uh, to, for uh, uh, evolution, natural selection to have done its work. Um, he was also, switching gears a little bit, he was also very politically active in this period, particularly in the 1880s. He was born in Belfast. He's so associated with Glasgow because he moved there when he was eight years old or something. But he was born in Belfast and had strong ties um, in Northern Ireland. And he was an extremely strong opponent of Gladstone's home rule policy and became a leader of liberal unionists uh, in the 1880s and campaigned strongly for liberal unionist causes. Um, this is one of the reasons why in 1892 uh, uh, Salisbury uh, gave him a peerage. It was partly a reward for his his political work, it's in recognition of his scientific work, and I think it's to leverage his scientific fame for political use as well. That it's now Lord, whoever, uh, Lord Kelvin supporting the liberal unionist cause. Um, he was uh, very much a man of his time, and, uh, and, and I think he was, so closely identified in the public mind with the cause of cable telegraphy and the imperial project that that was associated with. Um, and I think he saw almost everything he did as, as related to, to that. Um, so again, I'll, he's, he's left with a problem in 1892 of what name to choose. I don't want to begrudge Glasgow with him choosing the name Kelvin, but I think there's a good case for thinking of him as Lord Cable as well. Thank you.